And we're following breaking news right now. Jurors have found Peter Navarro guilty of two counts of contempt of Congress. This comes after the former Trump White House advisor failed to respond to subpoenas issued by the January 6th House Select Committee. Now, prosecutors accused Navarro of deliberately and illegally refusing to respond to those subpoenas for records and testimony. Now, Navarro argued he could not be compelled to testify before Congress. Obviously, the jury saw it differently. We've got Jessica Levinson here with us now. She's a CBS News legal contributor and a professor at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. We've also got Robert Legary with us by phone, uh, helping break this down. Jessica and Robert, thanks for joining us. Jessica, I want to start with you. This was a quick trial, very quick, uh, and a quick deliberation as well. So can you break down uh, why things moved so fast in this case? because there really wasn't much of a defense here. So when it comes to Peter Navarro and whether or not he was subpoenaed, he was. When it comes to the question of whether or not there was a good reason for the subpoena, there was. And that's really what you have to show. The defense in this case said, well, we're foreclosed from arguing things like executive privilege. That's because, frankly, executive privilege really doesn't apply in this circumstance. The defense put on a very thin case, and what they argued is that this could be inadvertent, that this might be a mistake that Peter Navarro did not comply. The prosecution put forward evidence that I thought was very compelling, and the jury did too, to indicate that, in fact, the subpoena was valid, that he knew about it, and that he willfully failed to comply. And that's the end of the story, and that's why you don't see this jury saying, let's come back for another day. And right now we're seeing the front of the courtroom as we expect Peter Navarro may come out and speak after this verdict. Robert, you've been following this case from the beginning. What's your reaction to this verdict? Hey, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. And to Jessica's point, this was a very fast proceeding. Um, defense called no witnesses. Uh, the prosecution only called three witnesses, and it only took about a couple of hours to go through those witnesses. Um, only one of those witnesses, all three of them, excuse me, were former staffers for the House Select Committee that investigated the January 6th attack. Uh, only one of them was cross-examined. As Jessica alluded to uh, last week, Navarro actually took the stand in a pre-trial hearing in which he said he wanted to be able to argue to the jury that he was under the assumption that executive privilege applied to his testimony. The judge ultimately decided that there was no concrete evidence in this case uh, for that uh, defense to be entered into the record. And so it really hamstrung the defense in terms of being able to, to provide uh, that defense to the jury. They've, they've, uh, Navarro has uh, Navarro has, uh, indicated outside of court that he would appeal this decision. Um, another contempt of Congress conviction, that of Steve Bannon, last year is before the appeals court right now. Um, and so this is going to be another case uh, that will make it to higher courts, and they're going to have to decide on that executive privilege uh, question. That's a good point, Robert. And Jessica, I want to talk about the Navarro defense, the executive privilege defense. He's saying White House officials can't be compelled to testify before Congress. Obviously, that didn't, that didn't work, but what was the basis for that argument? Well, that really was the basis for the argument. What he said here is that I was a senior White House official and that the communications that I had and that you're asking for regarding January 6th are covered by this thing called the executive privilege. I think what's important for people to know is that executive privilege is something that the Supreme Court has recognized does exist, but it is qualified and it is meant to protect the president and his senior advisors in certain types of communication so that they can have free and open communications. And it's meant to protect also national security information. It's not meant as a blanket protection against senior officials from complying with, for instance, congressional subpoenas and or grand jury subpoenas. And that's what we've seen time and time again when it comes to the former president and his aides asking for executive privilege as a reason that they don't have to testify. What they've been saying is, what the courts have been saying is executive privilege doesn't apply or at least come in and testify. And if you think a specific question raises executive privilege, then what you can do is say, I'd like to go to the court on that specific question. But Peter Navarro didn't show up at all. Robert, you brought this up earlier. Steve Bannon tried this same argument, convicted. Now Peter Navarro tries this argument, convicted. Does this basically set a precedent here 
that executive privilege does not apply when compelled to testify in a situation like this. Yeah, so just to be clear, the Steve Bannon argument, and apologies if this wasn't clear before, the Steve Bannon argument was closer to him arguing that he was following the advice of, an, of one of his attorneys by not complying. Remember, at the time of the January 6th, the, the period that the January 6th committee was investigating, you know, the period right before, right after the 2020 presidential election, Steve Bannon was not a White House official at the time. And so he was not arguing uh, that executive privilege truly applied, but rather that he was following the advice of counsel. That issue is currently being litigated, and so this will be a new defense that they will be appealing uh, to these two similar charges. Um, and, you know, just, just to point out, during the trial, the Justice Department said this is a very simple case. They told the jury he was supposed to comply with, this, with, uh, with the records request and, the, and demand that he show up on March 2nd, 2022 for congressional testimony, and he didn't. And so they said it might seem that simple, but it is that simple. And after deliberating for, you know, just under five hours, it seems that uh, this is not much of a uh, – they also found it simple as well. Peter Navarro's defense got up there, and they, in their closing argument, said – uh, many times the trailer was better than the movie, that the evidence actually did not uh, demonstrate to the jury effectively that it should be held in contempt. Again, a one-day trial um, and, and hours of deliberation seems to, seems to imply to us that the jury didn't even find it that simple. Now, Navarro didn't speak to Congress, but he definitely spoke to reporters during this trial. Jessica, we saw him many times speak to the public, to the media, during this trial, could that have played a role in this case at all? That's actually, that's a great question. That's something that you heard the prosecution bring up, which is that he was able to talk about this. And we've had the same question and same problem with respect to other former Trump aides who have said, I can't answer those questions. It's covered by executive privilege. But then in at least some iteration, you see them in the media talking about at least related questions. So yes, I think that could have played a role here. But I think the bottom line is that prosecutors proved that they issued a subpoena, that it was a valid subpoena, that Navarro knew about it, that he failed to comply. And that's really the end of the story. And I think what we will see on appeal is that Peter Navarro will say, what about my claim of executive privilege? I don't think that will be successful on appeal. He may try and argue on appeal again that this is an issue of inadvertence. But again, a jury has found very quickly today that this was not an inadvertent mistake. And as we wait to see if Peter Navarro himself will come out and speak, uh, Robert, does this seem destined for an appeal? Does it seem, you know, we've seen this in the Bannon case as well, but do we, does it feel like we're headed towards an appeal? It does, yeah. Uh, the his he has a, he has uh, indicated as much when speaking to the press going in and out of court uh, throughout the last week or so. Uh, so we should expect that. And to Jessica's point too, right? He's, he he uh, on the inadvertence. Another argument that they tried to make um, to the jury was that the the government had not proved that it was inadvertent. And they said we don't know where. Peter Navarro was on March 2nd, 2022, when he was supposed to show up to testify. And the prosecution got up there and countered right away and said, we do know where he wasn't. He wasn't testifying where the subpoena said he was supposed to be. Um, and so, you know, a very brief period of deliberation here. And just for comparison, because we're talking about these two different cases, the Bannon case took a couple of hours as well to deliberate, I think a bit less than this, if my memory serves me. And, and Jessica, correct me, but I think it was about three hours that the jury deliberated on that case, three to four. Um, and so this did take a little bit longer. Um, they did start, you know, right around the lunch hour. So that maybe could have affected um, how long it took them as well. But again, a pretty quick verdict here. Yeah, I think those of us who have covered federal cases before uh, know that the, the arm of justice in the federal court system usually does not work quite this fast. But uh, Jessica, I did want to ask if this conviction plays any role in the federal case against Donald Trump. So I, I don't think it does. I think this is really, I apologize. I think this is really a question of whether or not Peter Navarro faced a House Select Committee subpoena, whether or not there was a reason for the subpoena, and whether or not he complied with the subpoena. I don't think that we can impute the fact that the court, excuse me, the jury here found that, in fact, he failed to comply and should have. I don't think we can impute that to mean anything with respect to 
the federal case and the charges against the former president for trying to overturn the election. This is an aide who was asked to give more information to House Select Committee and failed to do so and will now, I presume, be punished for that. Robert, I want to ask you, based on the defense that we have heard, which is a very minimal defense from the Navarro team, uh, we've got to imagine that they are likely, they were likely expecting a conviction uh, based on uh, the defense that they put up. You know, can't speak to exactly what they were expecting, but I, I think uh, as we were talking about earlier, you, you know, their defenses were somewhat limited by that judge's ruling based on precedent. And so that's why we're kind of talking about, and Jessica is so eloquently talking about this potential for appeal, um, because they want, they were trying to make the argument in court that they should be allowed to talk about this privilege issue, knowing that likely it would not go their way. Um, and so now, you know, Judge Mehta, Judge Ahmed Mehta, who is uh, overseeing this case, uh, made that ruling, and they indicated to him that there would be an appeal. And so, you know, they, that was their defense. They tried it. They couldn't, it couldn't get it admitted. And so now they're going to make another effort to do that. But again, for right now, the, the, the conviction stands. Um, and, you know, it's important to know, too, uh, Steve Bannon was an ultimately sentenced to four months in prison. Uh, for this, um, for his two convictions, but his sentence was suspended, and he has yet to serve any jail time as that appeals process plays out. So while the conviction, you know, is here today, uh, and the sentence now we're hearing is going to be in January of 2024, um, it's yet to be seen when what that punishment will be, um, and you know what um, whether or not he'll have to serve it immediately. Very important distinction to make. Robert Legary, Jessica Levinson, thanks so much for joining us. Now, if Peter Navarro comes out to speak, we will bring that to you. For now, we'll take a quick break. This is CBS News.